Hello and welcome. This is Heavy Business. I'm Alia. And I'm Curtis. And today we have on Faye Scott Dench, aka Death Metal Mum. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Hi, thank you for having me. And a funny story, we actually had recorded a podcast with Faye last year and it somehow got lost. So we are remedying that right now today. Um, so I'm excited to talk to you again. And um, before we dive into like any more specific questions, could you be so kind as to give us a brief summary of who you are and what you do in the realms of metal? Yeah. Um, my name's Faye. Uh, as you said, at Death Metal Mum on most social platforms. Um, so I have a podcast called Metalheads PC, and I also do PR for Redefining Darkness Records and for Seeing Red Records. Um, I, I mean, also waffle about tech death on social media. So yeah, that's, that's me. I mean, excellent. And um, how did you get started in PR? Was that with Re Redefining Darkness that you started? Yeah, it was. Um, basically, Tommy, guy who owns the label, was looking for an intern, like a PR intern. And the timing was just perfect because I was looking to sort of get into the industry and I was just contacting like everyone. Um, and he got back to me and then we had a little meeting and then it just, it went from there really. So, yeah. I, I want to kind of dive into that just for a brief second. So uh, what was the learning curve like for you on doing PR? Mm. I mean, big because... I've have I have a background in like journalism, so I've been on like the other side of it. Um and so being behind the scenes as it were, like you know, I've learned a lot in a very short period of time, um, and just how hard people work and just the constant like um scheduling and the pressure and the the, the everything that PR involves. I mean, I love it, but it's mad. So it's it's um it's been a learning curve for sure, but a really uh, a really good one. So you kind of already had a clue of what you were doing before you started with Tommy, then. A tiny bit, as like, because as a journalist, I had to like book interviews, and so I had to go through their PR people and all that kind of stuff. So I, I kind of got a little glimpse of it. I had a somewhat of an idea, but um, yeah, that helps me. I think a little bit. Did you have to devise the list, or did Tom already have one? He's got a huge um, contact list. And then I've added a few as we've been on because I've made some contacts. I've got, obviously, he's got a lot of contacts in the US. Good. And I have quite a few in like Europe and the UK. So I've just been adding um, mine and sort of, yeah. So you just kind of sound like you kind of got started the same way I kind of did it. You just kind of like waltzed into it without really knowing, even though you were a journalist, you knew how it worked, but you hadn't really done it. So, um, can you kind of explain how you kind of got those relationships with the journalists? Cause I mean, it's what, like I had the same issue where it's like, I was given a list. I was working with someone that was Barry Ann at, uh, um, now I'm forgetting her label, but she had a list and then I had to kind of go and introduce myself to journalists. What was the process like for you doing that? It's, we kind of take it one at one at a time. So with each release, Tommy, he'll just sort of introduce me and like tag me and like stuff and put me on emails. And then I introduce myself, um, and we just do it sort of one at a time in that way. Um, a lot of them I knew anyway, just through my other work and just being a nerd and being in the scene and getting involved and through my podcast as well. Um, so, so far I've made some really good connections, but none that I hadn't already sort of already heard of, um, which is, um, I'm not boasting. <laughs> it's more like... Um, Boast if you need to, dude. Go for it. <laughs> no, it's not my style. It's more like it's because also through my podcast, I've had to book some really high profile people and some really um, cool musicians from really big labels and stuff. So I've just and I think I'm one of them people. People tell I mean, me I'm some I'm someone that people remember. I don't know why. I don't know what it is I do. But um, I think a lot of people, they have my name in the back of their head when in, in that way, when it comes to PR. If there are other people listening who are interested in getting involved with PR, how do you think they can kind of step into that career path? I mean, that's a good question. I think, you know, when I wanted to get into it, what I did was I did the only thing I thought was right, which is what I just, I contacted people. I got email addresses. Um, 
not spamming DMs because people hate that. Don't do that. <laughs> but I got, you know, their business emails and I, you know, I, I wrote a really nice email, um, like a template and sent it out to like the labels and people. And I got a few, even though they couldn't employ me or give me any work, they gave me a lot of really good advice. Um, especially some of the female PR people like Lisa from Hold Tight and Nikki Law from Breaking the Law, other ones like that. They gave me some really solid advice. So I would just say, just, just put yourself out there. You know, you, you know, you've got to be in it to win it. Um, what, is, what, do, what do you think is the DMing etiquette in a professional circumstance? When is it good and when is it not good? Mm, I think DMing's fine. It's actually a good way for like, especially for like smaller bands and stuff like to get in contact. But I think one DM, all the information you need, like repeating and spamming and like, just being too much that that's not okay but i think i've put a lot of guests on my podcast through dms actually because Same. just you see they're active on social media and you think well i could wait a week for them to respond to my email or i could just dm them um so i think it's fine as long as you're just respectful of the fact that people have lives and schedules and are busy um and they don't owe you anything i can agree with that I can agree with that. Um, when do you think it's inappropriate? What do you think is the difference that makes it annoying or not annoying in a professional context? I mean, personally, I mean, what annoys me with DMs, which I get quite a lot, is, is bands trying to like show me their new music, and they won't just they won't do it in a in a sort of succinct way. They do it in they'll send me like five, six, seven DMs, all these links. Right. And they'll do it sort of consistently week after week after week. That pisses I mean, me off. And I block them. I'm not interested. I don't care how good your music is. Like, don't do that. Um, I don't know. I just, I think it also depends on the person, doesn't it? Who, who, whoever it is DMing you. If you, if you think, are oh, there maybe a potential colleague or there maybe, you know, someone I would be interested in working with, then maybe I'm, I'm slightly more tolerant. I think generally speaking, nobody likes entitled people. And that's kind of the vibe that you get when people send yeah. consistent messages like that. It's like, well, you're not responding to me and I'm entitled to a response at least. So I'm going to keep sending you messages until you say something. Exactly. I'm kind of weird on this because like I go for a follow up sometimes if I think the person just didn't see it personally. That's different though. But it depends. Though. Yeah. It, there's kind of like a judgment call you have to make eventually on certain people it's like are they ignoring you for a reason or do they not literally not see the message right and sometimes people have thought i was ignoring them but i literally just didn't see the message so anyways that's my two cents now this doesn't have to be only applicable to pr but are there any tips you picked up from doing pr that you could say maybe would translate to fans um in their behaviors online or th their own promotional work yeah. i mean I mean, I mean, I'd say this to like the smaller bands we have who are maybe getting started. First of all, make yourself a really good EPK. Um, have I all mean, in one place so that if you're sending me something, just send me one link with all your stuff on. Because again, I don't want to be spammed with 12 emails with all your different stuff. Um, so that, that that's what I suggest. I mean, it's pretty basic, but it's important, I think. And um, do you think that should be a website or it should be a drive link or a PDF or does a format matter with EPKs? Um, I mean, I personally like when they've got, I, I mean, like a bio. So give me a PDF with a bio and then some files, share me, share some files with me. Um, websites. Um, yeah, that's fine. I just, just all in one place, just so I can, you know, I mean, I don't have to search through 15 emails and four dms to find what i need um actually made some notes here about my pr stuff where is it um yeah so i also recommend my bands to look at bigger more successful more experienced bands in the same genre what are they doing like what content are they posting um what kind of stuff is reacting well with them because obviously they're sharing an audience you know you're making the same kind of music I'm not saying go and copy your favorite band or everything they do because that will get tired very quickly and you'll get pulled out on that shit. But maybe use it as inspiration. Um, I think, you know, I look mean, at what their fans are engaging with, what's get maybe something of theirs that's gone viral. Um, use it as inspiration. Um, what else? 
Oh, yeah. One major thing that I'm ticks me off. Please respond to your emails. Or DMs, whatever it is. It's just... No matter what kind of person you are, you have to realize that being in a band, if, especially if you're in the label, it's a business. People have schedules. We have stuff to do. Um, if you're, if you know, someone wants to set up an interview with you, they're running on a schedule. You know, you have to respect that. No matter how much of a procrastinate you are yourself, you have to put that to one side and think, do you know what? People have got stuff to plan. They've got things to edit, stuff to go out. I have to respect that uh, as a person in the music industry. I mean, and that, you know, I think that counts for everyone. Um, um, what else? I think also with that note, it's also important to remember that that, that still applies if you're turning something down. Uh, because you want to turn things down in a clear way. Otherwise, I mean, that's the best way to maintain a healthy connection with that person to potentially get more opportunities in the future, right? Absolutely. You know, if, if it's if it's a no, then say no. Don't just ignore it. Um, I've been in that situation. That it's just, it comes across, it's not just as rude, but sort of like you're just not interested or you're not really I mean, involved and, and focused. And that's um, not a good vibe to give off. Um. Oh yeah, just networking. Like, go to shows. And I know it sounds really basic, but if you're a death metal band, go to death metal shows. Like, go not only with the intention of promoting yourself, because no one likes that when you're just talking about yourself and your own band, but also just to meet the other band members. You know, to get this become a memory for them, become like get a personal relationship with them in some way. Um. I think I know I know a lot of bands that have gotten gigs through that. Um, so I think that's just, that's a really good thing for self-promotion. And it's free. Well, ticket price. But you know what I mean? It's not, not going to cost you loads of money. And you can drink beer. So, I mean. The best ne networking events. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean. I mean. So moving on to social media, I, you have like a, you have a pretty vibrant and active social media presence. People actually interact with the things that you post. Um, do you have any advice on best practices on how to get engagement and or stay engaged online? I mean, hmm. I think being consistent. I mean, um, I notice a lot of people it's it's about finding a balance because you sometimes you can you can post too much and it just sort of saturates people's feeds and people just don't they end up muting you or blocking you and that's obviously not what you want um but then again if you're only posting once a month people aren't gonna notice you you're just sort of gonna fade into the background so I think it's about getting a balance of being consistent um I tend to use the same kind of words and like hashtags and stuff like when I'm posting just to you know, maintain some kind of consistency and familiarity and, you know, I have the same kind of humor across my posts. Um, I think it's just being being consistent um, across the board with, you know, all the content you're posting and what you're talking about and, you know, I think slowly you'll build up a sort of loyal following for want of a better word because that sounds strange, but like people who are going to come back and, and, and be interested in what you've got to uh, show or say. I mean, it's sort of a parasocial relationship that they talk about, like people develop with like their favorite podcast hosts or something. Um, and you have to have interactions to be able to feel a connection. I think it's really challenging for bands like in between albums. I know we've had a couple of podcast episodes talking about what you can post in between albums, but a lot of times it feels like what you're posting in between albums is kind of fruitless unless you're playing live shows or actually doing something active. You don't really want to post nothing posts, posts that don't mean anything or cloud up people's feeds. So it is a balance. I mean, it is. And this is this is one of the issues like, I mean, it will be like you say, if they're not promoting their own like a new album or some new merch or something, they're like, oh, what do I talk about? And that's when I say to them, you know, go and look at what these other bands are doing and try and get some inspiration from that. Um, because 
you know, you go and look at a, like a more experienced band, like I said, you know, they've got it down. They've been doing it for years. You know, they've probably got some social media person doing it for them. Do you know what I mean? Who's actually paid to do it. Um, so that helps. What would be your number one tippy top tip uh, for people on Twitter, Faye? Because you seem to excel at Twitter. Most bands seem to suck at Twitter. Um, most people are leaving Twitter right now. Um, I seem to get see a lot of people going on threads, which I'm not convinced is better than Twitter. I don't know your opinion on that, but I don't mind it. But it doesn't really, I don't know, it seems worse in a way. But anyways, your thoughts and number one tip and trick on Twitter, I guess. Consistent hashtags. Um, hashtags on Twitter? I never use hashtags, really. Yeah. Matt? I can see that the... Um... The posts I use specific hashtags on, they get it gets way more engagement. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Um. This is why you have double the followers I do, I guess. Also, because I'm a girl, I hate to fair, say fair, fair, fair. It does it. help. Girls See, I'm not allowed. I'm not allowed to say that. I'm not allowed to say that. So you, that's good. You, that. you can say that. Um. Can say that. I think. Yeah, consistent hashtags. Just interesting content. I know that sounds so obvious, but you know, these people posting like your picture of your breakfast hashtag metal Twitter, it's like no. It's not it's not relevant. Um What if it's I like pancake it's, and sausages though? Everybody likes that. That sound good. <laughs> but I think only it, if your sausages are arranged arranged in a pentagram on top of your pancake. Yes. yes. And you squirt ketchup on them to make it look like blood. Then I'm interested, right? <laughs> um yeah, I think just consistent hashtags, um, engaging content. I mean, I see, you know, you see just because it's Twitter is a very visual place because it's obviously there's you can comment and have a sort of discussion, but you're not you're scrolling through your feed. You want something to grab your attention. So think about the visual aspect of whatever you're posting, um, I, you know, a purely text-based tweet is going to get much less engagement than like, it's got if it's got a picture on it or something. Um, just, you know, that kind of stuff. I don't know why I have so many followers because I'm just, I mean, I've only got to, like just under 8,000, so I'm not like, it's not huge, but, it's enough. It's, uh, you know, just for little old me, I don't know. I, but I think, unfortunately, my gender has a lot to do with it being on there because it is a kind of a sausage fest. Sorry, guys. Um, but yeah, I would say those two things really. I think you're funny. And I think, think that helps a lot. Yeah, I think having humor helps just in general because well, she also posts a lot of metal stuff. So I do. I post a lot of metal stuff. I post a lot of merch. Um, yeah. because I like people ask me why I do it. Like if I'm trying to be some kind of model, I'm like, a, I I eat way too much cake for that. B I do it because I like seeing other people post their match because it makes me think, oh, I need that shirt. That looks cool. Um, I mean, so yeah, I think I think just having a sense of humor, really. I mean, what do you think about threads? You didn't really answer that question. Threads. I'm on threads. I I'm so terrible at consistently posting all these different apps. Like if there was just one button, that'd be great. Um, I forget all the time. Fair. <laughs> I think I have Instagram and Twitter, so Threads is like a mixture of those, and I don't feel like I need it when I have uh, both of the other ones. Um, sure. But I think if Twitter got deleted, then I think maybe it would be a really good sort of alternative to to Instagram. Sure. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I mean, I mean. So let's move on to talking about your podcast now. People can find your podcast by searching for Metal Heads Podcast, two words for Metal Heads. And um, yeah, it's a very fun podcast, very personable. And um, I just wondered what your inspiration was and motivation was when you started the podcast. I mean, so, I mean, it stemmed from that metal Twitter community that we've briefly mentioned. Um, I just loved um, the other podcasts that I've found on there and I couldn't really find any female hosted ones and I thought well that would be cool to sort of um I mean have my own podcast where you look at because we talk about a lot of female issues in the in the metal industry um it's not all that but we do focus on a lot of that um especially my female guests um 
but also I have a background in psychology and it really interests me. Um, I, mean, I did my bachelor's degree in the effect that music has upon our dream content. So I've always been interested in the sort of effect that music can have on us, like, like our mental state and our physical health. And I thought it would be interesting because I couldn't really find any other ones sort of looking at sort of blending psychology and metal, especially extreme metal, which is what I focus on. So I thought I'll just try it, you know, it's not, it, it'll just be like fun hobby for me. And it's just grown into something very, very fun. And I've had the pleasure of having some really cool guests, some really amazing, um, legendary uh, guests. And then top of the list, my own mother, of course, because she beat the real one. Um, so yeah, I think it was just, it stemmed from that metal community online. I mean, other than your mother, who has been your favorite interview? Brian Slagle. Firstly, because he just has so many cool stories. Because he, he, I mean, he's just, he's just, he's been around since the beginning, hasn't he? So he, his head must, I could have talked to him for days. Um, and also just because he was really, he was really laid back. And I always get really nervous when I talk to these people because I think, oh, you know, they're obviously really busy and they've, you know, they've always answered these questions like a million times before. But he was super nice and he was super chill. I mean, just really responded very well to the question I asked all my guests, which I was shitting myself. Um, but yeah, it was very fun. I mean, was there a particular question you were nervous about asking him? Yeah, I have a recurring question, um, which I'm thinking about changing um, to something else. Equally as dirty, but not the same. And I was, I've asked everyone, including my mum. And I thought for consistency, I have to ask him as well. But I mean, he's I mean, this legend I mean, of metal. And I'm going to ask him this really, it's kind of personal. Thankfully, he answered it very nicely and he laughed. But I was, I was, I was genuinely like, should I ask him? Should I not? But yeah, I did. And he laughed. So listeners will have to tune into your episode interviewing Brian Slagle to know what that question is. Yep. You will. Um, that is from the gift or curse segment though, right? It is. It's the last question in my gift or curse segment. So what was the inspiration for that? It's such a interesting premise for a segment. Thank you. Um, I just I mean, wanted because a lot of the stuff I talk about in my podcast, it can be quite heavy because we talk about sort of mental health sometimes or, or uh, gender issues within the metal scene. So it, it can be quite in depth and sort of emotional at times. So I just wanted something that I could end my episodes on that was a bit more lighthearted and a bit like made people laugh. Um, and I was just doing some research and I found, and I wish I could remember the name of the podcast. I found something similar on another podcast and I just sort of changed it a little bit, changed the name to sort of fit mine so I mean not just like straight out plagiarizing other people's stuff um yeah and I think I tried it in the first couple of episodes and it went down well with my guests and I think it's just it's a nice way to end yeah can you give us a gift or curse prompt <laughs> right now Ooh. I mean I mean the classic one I do with everyone which gets a lot of discussion is pineapple on pizza gift or curse what do you think, Curtis? I don't mind it, but I did not my favorite. So is there like a neutral option here? No, no, no gift or curse. Thing. I'm going to say curse because I wouldn't really want to have it on as a routine thing. Once in the odd while, sure, but I wouldn't order it or anything like that. Yeah, I'm going to say gift because I like it and I love how it's prompted so much fervent discussion online consistently about whether it's proper or not i mean i know it's not proper so but would you eat it consistently is my question because like i said i like it but it's like would i order it all the time mm. i mean usually i want a mix so usually sure. if i'm ordering pizza with my husband we'll get two kinds of pizza and so one of them will maybe have pineapple on it and one of them won't so i can have a sweet and i can have a savory and, you know, alternate between the two. That makes sense. I'm talking like if it's just the one. Okay, that I could go with 
I could go with gift. Okay. Now, Faye, you haven't answered this question, so now you have to answer the controversial question. Curse. It's disgusting. Get fruit the fuck away from my pizza. That's but you're awesome. British. That's not... The British people are crazy with their food. Come no, on. You guys don't. have those chip buddies. Or... Oh, they're so good. Don't... They, oh, don't... That's, those are crazy to us. Like, come what on. What is that? It's a bread roll. Um, You put butter in it, and, like, I'm talking a layer of butter about this thick, right? And then you put, uh, yeah, fries. But those are British fries, which are like this thick. It melts the butter. It, oh, can't beat it. Just- See, that's crazy to me. Like, that that's like just as, like, that's just as bad, if not worse, than pineapple on pizza. Like, come on. No, that's that's like what a carbs. kid eats over here. Like, a that's two-year-old would eat that. It's just carbs on carbs. Fruit on pizza. It is. It's just carbs on carbs. It's, it's, yeah, but it's that's kind what of- a kid would eat. <laughs> it's not that's crazy, though. Like it. It's nostalgic. It's like it reminds us of what we ate as a child. Yeah, it's like what you'd feed to a five picky five year old. Anyways, I'll shut up. Yeah, but I would say it's like the opposite extreme as pineapple on pizza, right? It's like a very bland, yeah. simple. Versus... I'd just be glad I asked you guys the pineapple question. Has there been any lessons you've learned from hosting a podcast that have helped you grow and develop it? I mean, I mean, eh. I mean. I think everything I've mentioned already really just just being consistent and also trying to promote it but not like spamming people and and I try and link it to my other social profiles as well because I have a I've got nearly 3,000 followers on my podcast pages but I try and link it to my other ones as well just to sort of make the audience a bit bigger um and also it's relevant to all the other stuff I post um I mean, I think just keeping up good, again, good personal working relationships with these, you know, because I, a lot of contacts I have, I know them through my podcast, but also through my PR work. So they know me for both sides of things. Um, I think that helps. Awesome. Curtis, do you have any more questions before we wrap up? I apologize to all the British people I offended. I mean, that's not a question. <laughs> Is it okay if I apologize to the British people that I offended? <laughs> no, I don't know, I Faye, is it? <laughs> On behalf of my people, you're forgiven. <laughs> cool. My grandmother so was very British. Just, just, just for the record, my grandmother was British, so I technically have some part. Okay, you're forgiven. But um, for a final question, I think my only final question is, um, so what's your next plans in terms of your industry role do you have plans on expanding outside of pr or starting your own company if you're allowed to say or is it like you're just redefining darkness and that's your thing i have goals that i'm working towards um nothing that i will make make public or anything but i have um things i mean in progress um also starting a new podcast with a friend of mine who's also metal related. Um, so we've got things happening slowly, but surely. World domination is imminent. I get it. Hell yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Faye. Everyone go follow Faye at death metal mom. If you're not ready on all platforms and follow her metal heads, metal space heads, space podcast. Uh, on Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. And yeah, thanks for listening. And until next time, make like a bowl and throw those horns up.